Assistant Director of the Purdue Institute of Inflammation, Immunology, and Infectious Disease. And I welcome you and uh, our special guest today to another Research Spotlight series. Our, we are featuring Dr. Jonathan Shanahan from uh, the School of Health Sciences. And uh, Dr. Shanahan is uh, a fairly new member of PI4D. Um, and we're excited to have him today tell us a little bit about his work on nanoparticle induced toxicity due to underlying disease status and uh, some of his work on, on uh, and this area uh, from an inflammatory perspective that we're very interested in. So without further ado, uh, Dr. Shanahan, please take the microphone away. I'm going to try to get out of the video so that I can maximize my bandwidth, which uh, is being stolen away by my kids. Uh, but thank you and welcome. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Tommy. Uh, so today I'm going to be discussing some of my recent research uh, involving nanoparticle-induced toxicity, specifically in underlying disease states and the exacerbated toxicity that's observed. So you'll see here on this title slide a picture, you know, we're really proud of in the lab that was produced by my graduate student, Saeed. Um, you can see here macrophages and neutrophils uh, from the lungs of mice that have been exposed to nanoparticles. And you can see the internalization of nanoparticles actually within these cells. Uh, so this was produced uh, utilizing the hyperspectral dark field microscope. Uh, so you can actually see the nanoparticles both inside the macrophages and the neutrophils that have been recruited to the lung following the exposure. So just to give everybody kind of a brief overview of my laboratory, um, my laboratory focuses on nanotechnology health and safety, specifically looking at and examining cardiopulmonary and immune health responses induced by exposures. Uh, we also uh, have a large component of our laboratory that's focused on the nanoparticle biocorona. Uh, so we'll talk about this more in depth within the uh, within the presentation today. But what's uh, become known is is that you know we don't really even understand once nanoparticles are introduced into a physiological environment those initial interactions that occur and how those dictate cellular interactions as well as responses uh, that facilitate toxicity and modify the effectiveness of these nanoparticles when they're utilized for biomedical applications. And then the overarching theme of my research is this examination of susceptibility to toxic insults. So you and I are, are, are all individuals uh, when we have an exposure occur, we, we respond differentially to that. Some of us respond in a susceptible manner where we have exacerbated toxicity and disease progression. And so my laboratory aims to examine those susceptibility mechanisms that may predispose an individual to uh, disease. Uh, specifically what our laboratory examines is highly prevalent underlying disease states. So if you, if you look at our population, uh, the percentage of individuals that suffer from one or more chronic diseases continues to expand. So our populations um, are, are more represented in most cases by disease models. And in order to understand the most sensitive groups of, uh, of our population, as far as exposures occur, and, in, and to assist us in protecting the public, it's important to understand uh, susceptibility in these groups. So first of all, what is nanotechnology? Uh, it's defined as uh, a synthesized or engineered material that has at least one dimension under 100 nanometers. Uh, this is a very broad uh, field, includes a large variety of materials. Uh, specifically, nanotechnology touches upon you know, renewable energy uh, use in construction. So in construction materials, this makes them extremely durable, but also very light. Uh, it's in a number of consumer products, such as cosmetics. Uh, then there's a variety of biomedical applications that are enabled by nanotechnology, such as nanomedicine, where nanoparticles are so small that they can translocate to the body easily and they can be utilized for the delivery of drugs and therapeutics. They're also utilized as antimicrobial agents, such as silver nanoparticles that undergo dissolution and, can, um, and are used to manage uh, pathogens uh, such as microbes and uh, things that may grow on, on items such as doorknobs. Uh, 
Uh, you also have targeted imaging and diagnostics. So they're utilized for their imaging capacity uh, in such uh, cases as like MRI. So the consumer applications here are projected uh, to continue to grow um, at this linear rate uh, through, two th through 2024 and beyond. Here we have a list, a few of my favorite examples of actually nano enabled products where someone may be exposed. So starting here at the bottom, you have an airplane. So as we as a population get heavier, in order for airplanes to get in the air and stay in the air, we need to make the airplanes lighter. And so carbon nanotubes within the wings of the airplane allow the wings to maintain flexibility, but also they are durable enough uh, and solid enough to actually maintain flight, but they're also lighter. And that means that you can get the plane up in the air uh, utilizing less fuel. Uh, the, the fiber, the uh, bats you see, as well as the bike here, are carbon nanotube infused. Uh, so th they're ca carbon fiber bikes and bats, and this allows uh, these, uh, you know, sports equipment to be very durable, but also very light. Uh, the doorknob picture here, a lot of times doorknobs in high volume touch areas actually include silver nanoparticles, and that's in order uh, for their antimicrobial properties just as are the army fatigues uh, shown here. So a lot of times, you know, deployed officers um, are not able to wash their clothes as regularly as, they, as you normally would. So they infuse uh, the, the combat fatigues with silver nanoparticles to act as an antimicrobial and antibiotic uh, agents. Uh, you have a uh, sunscreen here, so titanium oxide and zinc oxide are incorporated into sunscreens. Uh, that provides the barrier for the UV light. Up above, you have nosebleed uh, fabric. So what this is, is this is actually nanoparticle infused with a nanoparticle known to induce coagulation, which stops nosebleeds. Uh, the, the surface area of nanoparticles enables them to uh, function very well in, you know, renewable resources such as these solar panels seen. And then my personal favorite here is a picture of white powdered sugar covered donuts. Um, so titanium oxide nanoparticles gives an artificial white uh, color. And uh, that's that those used to be incorporated into a lot of white powdered sugar donuts uh, in order to give that, um, that white uh, color to the sugar. Um, that now has started to be phased out due to some of the toxicity concerns that have arisen through the uh, inhalation of titanium oxide nanoparticles. So there are a lot of concerns regarding nanotoxicology, uh, specifically the synthesis outpaces toxicity assessment. So there's so many combinations and properties of nanoparticles, um, and there's so many properties that can be very uh, that can be modified, uh, that they're produced at a rate that exceeds our capacity to evaluate for them for toxicity. So one major concern with them is, can you actually stratify nanoparticles based on specific properties to determine which ones require more thorough testing than others? And that's a difficulty that the field is still dealing with. Another issue is limited understanding of exposure risk. So we're very good as, as toxicologists and in the field of nanotoxicology of understanding the hazards associated with nanoparticle exposures, but the technology in order to actually go in and sample and to evaluate what the actual human exposure risk is at a facility that's producing nanoparticles is, is kind of difficult. And without that information, it makes it almost impossible to utilize human relevant doses for your exposure studies evaluating hazards. Uh, nanoparticles, you got a variety of exposure routes. So, you know, this can occur in biomedical settings, consumer settings, environmental or occupational settings. You have injection of nanoparticles. Uh, due to these biomedical applications, you can have ingestion of them when they're incorporated into food storage containers. Uh, you can have dermal exposure in occupational settings, but the most prevalent exposure pathway is inhalation. Uh, so as these nanoparticles are produced and utilized, uh, people tend to breathe them in and you uh, have toxicity concerns. There's also been difficulty often translating findings from laboratory to clinical applications and even from in vitro to in vivo studies. And in the next portion of this uh, talk, we're gonna kind of go into in depth why this we believe in our lab this may be occurring. And then lastly, what's important for us is that, you know, most evaluations are performed in healthy models. And so this causes uh, issues regarding environmental and biomedical uh, you know, exposure. So specifically as our population, a higher percentage of us uh, 
suffer from a chronic disease state and we're exposed environmentally to these nanomaterials or nano-sized particles, um, you know, you may see exacerbated responses that you would not expect from the safety evaluations that you performed in the healthy model. Further, with their increased incorporation into biomedical applications, it's very important to um, evaluate these uh, nanomaterials early on in these disease models. So if you're about doing these evaluations primarily in healthy models, to evaluate safety of a biomedical um, nanoparticle or one that you're going to utilize in a biomedical setting, we have to remember that healthy people, by definition, do not receive therapeutics um, for the most part. Uh, so we have to understand that we're not really comparing apples to apples here. Uh, our studies would likely be better and, and translate extremely uh, better as from a safety perspective by utilizing disease models where these uh, biomedical nanoparticles will likely be utilized. So for today's talk, you know, we're going to sit around this uh, idea of susceptibility. So susceptible subpopulations are considered to be people that are, you know, elderly, young, uh, people with differential nutritional status, uh, you know, pregnancy is an area of concern when it comes to susceptibility, stress, and then like, lastly, disease. So our research focuses primarily on this disease population due to the prevalence, and we look at prevalent diseases that we'll discuss throughout the the talk today. The first portion of our project here examines the utilization of nanoparticles for biomedical applications. So what occurs when a nanoparticle is injected into individuals is, is that it's rapidly coated with biomolecules on the surface. This biomolecule coating is, is termed the biocorona, and this dictates interactions with cells and modifies their responses as well as downstream effects and likely can likely contributes to differential toxicity observed between disease model, between individuals, potentially those with underlying disease. Another portion of our laboratory's research is examining inhalation exposures and specifically examining why individuals with underlying disease states might have an exacerbated response following inhalation to these exposures. So we have to remember that the disease state that modifies the surface of the nanoparticle here on the left also modulates the, the, the body's physiology as well as the cells and how they interact and respond to the exposure. So first we're gonna discuss the nanoparticle, uh, you know, disease-induced alterations in nanoparticle biomolecule interactions. So the nanoparticle biocorona forms in physiological environments when biomolecules coat the nanoparticle. The addition of the biocorona alters the physiochemical properties of the nanoparticle, which affects the, the function of the nanomaterial, the biodistribution, cellular uptake and clearance, as well as toxicity. So the, the formation of this is dependent upon the nanoparticle itself. So what are the properties of the nanoparticle dictate what biomolecules bind to the surface? The amount of time it is in the physiological environment, so that can be, so as proteins absorb, as they are released, as lipids are absorbed and released, and then lastly, the physiological environment. So when, when the field began investigating this, uh, everybody was focused on properties. So everyone was saying, okay, if I modify the size, the shape, the surface coating, how does that affect the biomolecules that absorb on the surface and how does that influence toxicity? We were interested though on our side about the physiological environment. So if you have an individual that's healthy versus an individual with a common uh, disease state and you keep the nanoparticle the same, how did those disease states modify the coating of biomolecules on the surface and, in there, and thereby the consequences that occur after exposure? So our first uh, you know, disease that we examined was hypercholesterolemia. Uh, this is a result of unhealthy lifestyle choices, such as poor diet, obes obesity, you know, sedentary lifestyle, smoking, alcohol. Over time, it leads to heart disease by the development of atherosclerosis, affects over 13% of the U.S. population currently. And so you can see here at the top left, you know, we have two tubes here. Uh, one is a healthy serum, and then one is the hyperlipidemic or hypercholesterolemia uh, uh, serum. So what we did in this first evaluation was we took iron oxide nanoparticles. These are super, these are nanomaterials that have super paramedic properties. Uh, they're utilized as catalysts for reactions, biosensors for magnetic separations, and then for MIR contrast agents. So here you can see some images um, utilizing uh, TEM, uh, electron microscopy to visualize the nanoparticles that we're utilizing. 
These nanoparticles had a size of about 43 nanometers and had a negative charge of, uh, you know, minus 44. Uh, the nanoparticles per microgram, you know, we're looking at about two uh, billion individual nanoparticles here uh, per microgram of material weight. Uh, so you've got a tremendous number of nanomaterials there. So our first question, uh, or what we did was we took Spreg dolly rats, they were fed either a normal or a high fructose diet. This resulted in a doubling of the cholesterol levels in their circulation. We then isolated the serum from these rats and we incubated nanoparticles uh, in the serum for eight hours, allowing a biocrona to form. Following formation of the biocrona, we evaluated physiochemical properties, characterized the nanoparticle biocrona, and then uh, assessed endothelial toxicity, assuming that the route of exposure here was an injection. So here we have images of the nanoparticles, as well as uh, demonstrating the uh, formation of the biocrona around the surface. Uh, we see that there was an in a slight increase in nanoparticle size that occurred and a, a decrease in surface charge. Most interestingly, what we found was the normal biocrona had a cholesterol content of 7.2 micromolar, whereas the lipid biochrona or the hypercholesterolemia biochrona had almost a tenfold increase in the cholesterol that was present in the, uh, in the, in the biochrona. When we utilized a proteomics approach, uh, what we found was that 92 proteins were shared uh, between the two biochronas that formed in these two states. 11 proteins were unique to the healthy biochrona, whereas 29 were unique to the um, lipid corona. When we have uh, nine, the 92 in common, however, that does not mean that they're there in equivalent amounts. So we actually have, quanti we have quantitation data on this and we, we demonstrate that some proteins are absorbed uh, more so in the healthy conditions than in the disease and some are absorbed more so in the disease conditions than the healthy. And those match with our expectations and what we know regarding apolipoprotein content. Um, so apolipoproteins that are more indicative of low density lipoprotein were found in higher abundance in the uh, hypercholesterolemia uh, biochrona compared to the healthy uh, one. So when we exposed endothelial cells to these, uh, we have examined uptake. And so what you can see here in the graph on the left is that nanoparticles without a biochrona are taken up rapidly um, by cells. And then the, the ones with the healthy biochrona shown in green, as well as the lipid biochrona in red, were taking up less so at one hour. But then what we see at three hours is a plateauing of uptake uh, due to the addition of the biochrona. I mean, uh, do, with a plateauing of uptake in nano, with, of nanoparticles without a biochrona. But what we see with the lipid-based biochrona shown here in red over time is this preferred uptake uh, that occurs over time. Uh, so the cells prefer to take up that lipid-rich biochrona. Uh, our other examinations looking into the mechanism of this tend to suggest that this is mediated by scavenger receptors on the surface of cells. So scavenger receptors take up negatively charged particles as well as, uh, as, well as uh, lipids such as low-density lipoproteins and, um, and in, in internal, for internalization and removal. So we believe that when we coat these nanoparticles with cholesterol, as we've got a negatively charged particle, as well as a lipid coated particle that prefers uptake through these scavenger receptors. This uptake at 24 hours that was exacerbated in the lipid rich biochrona was, uh, was observed as well um, by qualitatively by electron microscopy. So the top figure here is a is exposure of endothelial cells um, to iron oxide nanoparticles. Down here is the exposure to uh, with a healthy biochrona, so we can see a slight increase in uptake that occurred. And then with the lipid-rich biochrona, we see this exacerbated internalization. So then we uh, said, well, what's the inflammatory response that's occurring here? We ran a PCR panel. Uh, here's a heat map demonstrating the uh, you know, changes in gene expression that were observed. If we just zoom in on one, uh, BCAM1, this is a vascular cellular adhesion molecule one. It's a marker of inflammation expressed by endothelial cells. You can see here that the lipid biocorona um, initiated an exacerbation of inflammation. This was also observed in interleukin-6, TNF-alpha as well. 
So this was confirmed uh, by, uh, you know, nor, you know, traditional PCR, and we also made sure that our, our responses were nanoparticle specific to the changes in the biocorona by exposing cells to uh, any kind of carryover of normal serum or lipid serum that may have been left over by our processing methods. And we found that this nanopart the nanoparticles were what was eliciting the response, and this was variable based upon coding. So it was not just free proteins that were left over due to our preparation methods. Um, we then, uh, you know, utilized uh, cellular image, imaging to look at changes in VCAM1 expression on the surface of the cell. So remember over here, we're just looking at gene expression. Over here, this imaging, we're actually looking at, okay, did it express more or less of the protein on the surface? And you can see here shown in green that cells exposed to the lipid biocorona on iron oxide nanoparticles demonstrated an enhanced uh, presentation of VCAM1 on the surface, supporting an increased uh, inflammation. So now we wanted to zoom in. So, you know, we had just exposed cells in, you know, high cholesterol serum, and there's a, there was lots of changes that we observed. So in this next experiment here, what we did was we took human LDL uh, that had been isolated and formulated nanoparticles that were rich in only LDL on their biocorona. So the blue bars here are, are nanoparticles that had no biocorona. The red bar is nanoparticles that were incubated in fetal bovine serum. And then the green bar is nanoparticles that were incubated in fetal bovine serum supplemented with low density lipoprotein. And so what you can see here in the blue bars is that total cellular uptake of the nanoparticles, uh, again, was taken up more so when there was no biochrona present, uh, but that plateaued at three hours and was maintained at 24 hours, showing that nanoparticles are taken up, but only to a certain amount when there's no biochrona present. When the FBS is present, what we see is we see this increased uptake that's a little slower over time, likely due to the diminished charge that was observed when the biochrona was added. However, what we see with the LDL-rich biochrona is this exacerbated or enhanced uptake, suggesting that the nanoparticles are more readily internalized um, over time, that they're, that they're more taken up. Uh, when we look at TNF-alpha as a marker of inflammation, looking at gene expression here, one thing that's interesting is you'll remember that at one hour, the nanoparticle without a biochrona was taken up the most but it elicited a smaller inflammatory, a lower inflammatory response than nanoparticles that had that LDL rich biochrona. So this means since there was less taken up and associated with the cells, that this uh, coating with LDL and addition of LDL on the surface results in a more potent inducer of inflammation. Uh, this inflama inflammatory response was found to be exacerbated at later time points. Uh, this this uh, experiment utilized macrophages. So at the bottom, you're seeing uh, uh, electron microscopy images demonstrating that there was enhanced internalization of the nanoparticles uh, following addition of the low density lipoprotein to the surface. So now we, we zoomed in a little further and looked, examined specific proteins that were absorbed on the surface. So what we did was we, we uh, looked at uh, metabolic syndrome uh, as a uh, metabolomic disease that modifies, uh, you know, protein uh, levels within the circulation. We incubated nanoparticles in those, compared them to healthy, and we saw this trend in a lot of our studies. We saw this in our mouse samples, our rat samples, as well as in human samples, uh, where the apolipoprotein content in these disease models were, uh, had increased amounts of apolipoprotein A5, apolipoprotein E, apolipoprotein B, which is consistent with addition of increased amounts of LDL to the surface. And then other apolipoproteins were decreased. And that's to be expected because the, the, these are more uh, prevalent in healthy models uh, that maybe have higher levels of HDL in the circulation and lower levels of LDL. So we, perform, we, we formed a corona uh, that was either healthy, uh, metabolic syndrome, so complex, or one that just consisted of apolipoprotein A5, since it was the most, it was the one with the largest fold change difference between metabolic syndrome and healthy serum. And so when we looked at uh, macrophage chemotactin protein one, 
response after exposure in macrophages, we found that nanoparticles themselves at Biocrona elicited a small inflammatory response. When we put a healthy Biocrona on there, we get an increase in this inflammatory response. So what this means to us is if you're doing um, nanoparticle toxicity testing and you're just you're doing it in a uh, protein-free environment without serum present, you may be underrepresenting or underestimating the inflammation that could be induced. Then when we formulated the metabolic syndrome biochrome on the surface of the iron oxygen particles, we see an exacerbated response compared to healthy, suggesting that individuals uh, with metabolic disease may form a unique biochrona that it causes an exacerbated response compared to a healthy individual. And then lastly, when we looked at just um, apolipoprotein A5, we saw a significant act of exacerbation in response. So this is a biochrona that's only made up of apolipo A5. So what that, this suggests to us is, is that this differential between metabolic syndrome and healthy and inflammatory response may be driven by specific apolipoprotein components within the biochrona, such as apolipo A5. So we uh, kind of changing gears here a little bit. You know, we discussed metabolic syndrome. This is a prevalent disease state in the United States. This affects about 34% of our uh, population. It's also increasing in prevalence in the, in globally. You can see in Indiana, our rate's about 33%, uh, but in the Southeast, it goes as high as almost 37%. Metabolic syndrome is defined as an increase in waist circumference, hyperglycemia, hypertension, and dyslipidemia. Um, so that's what kind of brought our attention to it was this dyslipidemia component and this uh, modifications in the lipid levels that occur. So up until now, a lot of our research is based upon serum. So recently what we've been examining is actually uh, the inhalation of these particles and how the biochrona may affect exacerbated toxicity. So epidemiologically, it's been established that individuals with metabolic syndrome are increasingly sensitive to exposures. So here you can just see some examples. So, um, you know, when exposed, when inhalation of particulate matter of the size of 10 microns or greater, individuals with metabolic syndrome <coughs> uh, demonstrate an exacerbation in, uh, you know, inflammatory cells or white blood cells in their circulation following inhalation. When exposed to a particulate matter fraction of 2.5 microns or less, we see an increase in circulation of interleukin-6, C-reactive protein, and white blood cells. And then interestingly, first responders to the World Trade Center event, it was determined that if they had metabolic syndrome, their risk of developing in lung injury increased by over 50%. So this demonstrates individuals with metabolic syndrome when exposed to an inhalable insult have an exacerbated response in garden in, in regard to that exposure. However, those mechanisms aren't known. So we don't really know uh, how people uh, with metabolic syndrome and why they're more sensitive to these inhalation exposures. And we also don't understand that they haven't been evaluated for nanoparticles specifically. So that we've been looking at a more ambient particulate matter, you know, World Trade Center dust that's been established epidemiology, but not for specific nanoparticles. So this is some ongoing work currently in the lab. So what we've done is we've collected bronchoalveolar lavage fluid from the lungs of healthy and metabolic syndrome mice. We then incubate the nanoparticles uh, in these different lavage fluids. We then utilize an integrated lipidomics proteomics approach in order to characterize uh, the biomolecules on the surface. And then we perform toxicity assessments. So our preliminary data has demonstrated uh, that the metabolic syndrome induces a biochrono that is very unique. So there's 82 proteins that are present on the biochrono that are unique to metabolic syndrome. 30 are shared and those are different quantifiable amounts. So when we look at the lipids uh, that are part of this, we see very distinct lipid patterns of the lipids that bind the nanoparticle corona potentially following inhalation than when uh, they're inhaled in healthy individuals. And we believe that we're currently doing the toxicity assessments to determine if this, this uh, unique coding contributes to the sensitivity that's observed following inhalation in metabolic syndrome. So now we're gonna to move to the other side of this population, looking at mechanisms of exacerbated inflammation due to nanoparticle exposure. So as we just discussed, uh, individuals with metabolic syndrome when exposed, uh, to, to environmental exposures have an uh, exacerbated inflammatory response uh, that is not resolved uh, to reestablish homeostasis as observed in a healthy individual. 
So we kind of wanted to do, uh, we we're doing something different here. So instead of looking at exacerbation of inflammation, what we're looking, what we're going to examine is impaired inflammatory resolution. So the ability of the immune system to resolve inflammation and return to homeostasis. So uh, metabolic syndrome is defined by this, uh, you know, dysregulation of lipids. Lipids are known to be intricately involved in the regulation of inflammation. They're involved in the initiation as well as the resolution phase. Um, so what happens is, is that you have lipids, the specific lipids that, that are produced that stimulate an inflammatory response. And then later on, those switch over to specialized pro-resolving lipid mediators that facilitate resolution. And that's what call, that call, that's what kind of causes inflammation not to become, you know, exacerbated to an unhealthy level, and it also stops uh, inflammation from becoming sustained. So it means that inflammation has a set period of time in which it functions. We know from disease studies uh, that you know when we have an exposure or we have a disease scenario, that normally what happens is we see an increase in inflammation that goes unresolved and sustained for long periods of time, and that facilitates. Um, you know, disease progression. So for this study, what we did was we took uh, male mice. Uh, they were fed a healthy diet that had a 10% fat load or a high fat Western diet that had a 60% fat. Uh, they were fed this for 14 weeks to establish metabolic syndrome. They were then exposed via oral pharyngeal aspiration to 50 micrograms of 20 nanometer silver nanoparticles. 24 hours later, they were necropsied. At this point, we evaluated markers of metabolic syndrome to confirm uh, that our diet had induced disease differences, and as well as examine the acute inflammatory response. So here's just some brief data just demonstrating in blue here, the healthy mice compared to the uh, metabolic syndrome mice shown in red. So we did see increased body weight as well as increased total cholesterol levels indicative of metabolic syndrome. We also saw the other markers that we measured uh, were modified as expected due to uh, diet induced metabolic syndrome. So following exposure to the nanoparticles, we did see a uh, initiation of an inflammatory response as measured by influx of bronchial lavage neutrophils into the lung. Um, the interesting here, the metabolic syndrome mice demonstrated an exacerbated response as in regards to this neutrophilic influx um, that was beyond what was observed in the healthy. When we looked at cytokine expressions, we, we looked at macrophage inflammatory protein 2 utilizing ELISA, so this is the protein. We found that silver nanoparticles elicited an inflammatory response in both models, but that was exacerbated as well in the metabolic syndrome mouse model. We then utilized an MRM profiling of response. Uh, profiling uh, with our collaborators at the metabolic profiling facility here at Purdue. And we examined a variety of these. And what we observed was no changes in these inflammatory resolution mediators for healthy animal models. Uh, so we're looking at resolvin E1, Marsin 1, resolvin D5, and protectin D1. However, in our metabolic syndrome mice models, we saw a reduction in, these, in the uh, inflammatory resolution uh, markers. Uh, so what we believe is happening here is, is that you have reduction in metabolism and production of these inflammatory resolution mediators. So we saw a, a lot of these changed, including uh, RVE2, RVD1, 2, and 6. And this leads to an inhibition to suppress inflammation. So what you can think of here is, is that part of the exacerbation inflammation we're seeing here is the inability of the animals to put their foot on the brake and to suppress this inflammatory response. Now we do think that there is, you know, a, a prevalence here to put your foot on the gas and increase inflammation, but we believe that this resolution is impairing uh, their ability to resolve the inflammation that's induced by the exposure. So then we came back uh, to our animals and we had another group that was present where animals actually received statins. And so this was done to, to uh, reestablish lipid homeostasis to a degree and modulate those lipids in order to examine their role in the inflammatory response. So after six weeks on the diet, I mean seven weeks on the diet, the animals are transferred over to the same diet, but they can it contained 10 mg per kilogram of body, it, it contained uh, statin. And the statin was loaded enough to provide them with 10 milligrams per kilogram of body weight of statin per day. And so this was utilized as a comparison group to the group that stayed on the diet without a statin. And this allowed us to examine what the uh, 
you know, modulation of lipids we're doing to the inflammatory response following exposure. So here what you'll see is, is that after statin treatment, the, the healthy animal models shown here in the light blue uh, have the same inflammatory response as they did without the statin. However, the metabolic syndrome group saw a significant reduction in the inflammatory response, but it brought it only down to the levels observed in the healthy mouse model. So this, this statin treatment only reduced the exacerbation in response that was observed when the statin wasn't present. So this is important to us because actually, you know, an inflammatory response is good. That's how our body responds to exposures, but an exacerbated response is, is, is bad. So what we want to do is we want the body to still maintain an inflammatory response so it can respond to challenges. So we don't want to completely inhibit it, but, we, but what we don't want is those exacerbated responses. So what we saw in macrophage inflammatory protein two was that statins reduced the inflammation response in both animal models uh, to MIP2, as far as MIP2 production. Uh, also, what we determined here was that the decreases that were previously observed in the metabolic syndrome model following silver nanoparticle exposure were no longer observed when statins were present, uh, suggesting that this modification in lipids uh, levels uh, may have allowed the animal model to resolve inflammation better by stopping these decreases that were observed in uh, regulators of resolution. So at this point, we had, uh, you know, kind of this idea here of we're looking at metabolism of EPA and DHA to these resolution mediators. Uh, research has shown that with ozone exposures, that if you actually go in and give a, um, like a cocktail of, of these resolution mediators, you can inhibit the inflammatory response following inhalation of ozone. We didn't want to do a cocktail uh, with our next experiment. So what we did was we focused on upstream mediators uh, such as 18 HEPA, 14 HDHA, and 17 HDHA uh, that are upstream precursors to specific resolution mediators. And so we believe that this would allow us to identify uh, the contribution of these specific resolution mediators uh, to the exacerbated inflammation we observed in the metabolic syndrome model. So what we did here was we put animals on the diet for 14 weeks, then 30 minutes prior to their exposure, they were provided, uh, they were injected with either saline as a control or one microgram of each of the precursors. Um, so this was, so one group received 14 HDHA, one received 17, and one received 18 HEPA. And then we performed the necropsy and evaluated the similar uh, markers. Uh, so what we found in the groups that were provided with the 14 HDHA was we saw a reduction here in the inflammatory response that was also observed for MIP2. When we gave 17 HDHA, we saw a reduction that occurred. And then when we gave 18 HEPA, we did not see the reduction occur. So what this suggested to us was that uh, the, the, the most important resolution markers that were out of line in the metabolic syndrome model uh, dealt with DHA and DHA metabolism, specifically 14 and 17 HDHA, uh, because those are the ones that we saw inhibition of inflammatory responses, and we did not see that with 18 heavy. Okay. So uh, one of the unique pieces of equipment in our laboratory is a hyperspectral dark field micro mi microscope. Here you can see an image of the system. What this system allows us to do is to actually image and visualize nanoparticles um, on a slide. We can then characterize these nanoparticles. So here's the hyperspectral profile showing a peak at uh, 559 nanometers. And it's a, a unique shape for the nanoparticle. And this is produced based upon how the nanoparticle reflects, reflects light uh, based upon the size and properties of the nanomaterial itself. So a 20 nanometer iron oxide nanoparticle will, have, will produce a different spectral curve. What this is important about this is this allows us to identify nanoparticles uh, within biological samples without the need for staining. So what we did was we removed the nanoparticles from our health of uh, the cells from our healthy nanoparticles lungs. Uh, we can actually identify the nanoparticles within macrophages as well as in neutrophils. We can then go in and generate a spectral profile of these nanoparticles shown here. So the spectral profile of the nanoparticles within a healthy macrophage was 706 and inside a healthy neutrophil was 653. 
Uh, you can notice here that this is indicative of a red shift. So originally there were 559. So we see a shift to the right in these. And this is due to changes that occurs in the nanoparticle while they're being internalized. So this is like this is typically due to the incorporation of biomolecules on the surface as well as the subcellular localization of nanoparticles within the cell to different um, to different organelles such as lysosomes. We can then take the spectral profile of these nanoparticles and take an image. And so what we did here was we went back to our original image here. And what we said was identify every pixel in this image that matches the spectral profile based upon shape and peak and every, all the features. And we can then go back and confirm that we identified the nanoparticles. And you'll notice from this image here that the nanoparticles that are identified are all the intracellular nanoparticles. So we're not identifying these extracellular nanoparticles, and that's because they have a different spectral profile from after following internalization. Okay. So we did we perform when you look at this compared to our uh, nanoparticles outside of uh, the, the cells, we can see that this right shift occurred. And what's interesting about this, uh, this examination is, is that you can see that there's a specific spectral profile that exists for nanoparticles within neutrophils compared to macrophages. Um, so you can actually see that they, they look different spectrally uh, within cells. We did the same assessment for our um, you know, metabolic syndrome nanoparticles within the same cells. Uh, you can see the same shift occurred here to the right and that it was specific based upon macrophage or neutrophil uh, localization that occurred. So then the next question is, is do they look different within uh, healthy macrophages versus metabolic syndrome macrophages? So this might be, this might, if they did, that would be indicative of unique biochrono formation or unique localization within the cell. So what we found was that there was only a slight difference in macrophages. Uh, primarily did the difference is the shape of the curve, not the peak. Uh, so you can see that the metabolic syndrome produces a much broader curve uh, than, the, than the healthy one. And then in neutrophils, uh, the shape is rather similar with the healthy producing a more broad curve than the metabolic syndrome. And the healthy is, is quite is, is right shifted more so than the metabolic syndrome you know, within the neutrophils. So other items that are going on in our lab right now, um, one thing that's always bothered me is, is that when animals inhale nanoparticles or when individuals inhale nanoparticles or any kind of exposure, it does not um, uh, uniformly uh, spread out across the lung and distribute. So what you're showing here is, is that this is a modeling that was done by Yang, uh, published in 2019, that demonstrated that if you exposed animals uh, to uh, nanoparticles without surfactant or with surfactant, you got different distribution within the lungs. You can also see here from their mapping, uh, red is showing the nanoparticles and where they localize. You can see that this, this localization of nanoparticles is not uniform. So what this means to us as a concern is, is, is this not, lack of uniformity in the deposition of nanoparticles following the exposure, is that uh, affecting our sensitivity to be able to determine changes? So you can imagine that if you go in here and collect the sample from the top part of the lung here where you're not showing any exposure occurring, uh, you may be missing these hot spots of activity. So likely what happens is, is this is like a target. So the changes in inflammatory uh, mechanisms that we're measuring are likely really high here where they deposit. But then as we move further away from that deposition, the changes are likely reduced. And so based upon where you're sampling at from this lung tissue, you may get very different responses based upon this position of exposure. You may also, if you go in and homogenize the entire lung to look at its effects, you're getting a lot of tissue here that did not receive an exposure and may not be, uh, and that may dilute your signal and your ability to resolve this. So we, uh, we've got uh, plans in the future and we have, do have preliminary data um, utilizing a multi-imaging approach uh, to look at our mass spec changes. Uh, so here what we have is some of that preliminary data where we have our healthy control. Uh, here we're looking at uh, palmitic acid. And so what you can see here is that after silver nanoparticle exposure, you have an increase in palmitic acid in the healthy animal model's lung. And this uh, is demonstrated, but you still have these hot spots that occur. But if we had homogenized this entire tissue and then performed um, our typical assessments, we may not, this signal may have been diluted, we would not have seen these alterations because of the amount of healthy tissue. 
You can see here in the metabolic syndrome control, there's a higher amount of this palmitic acid. And then when the silver nanoparticle exposure occurs, you get this reduction that occurs. Uh, so this is kind of one of those areas in our lab that we're kind of proceeding with further is, is utilizing these mapping approaches in order to look at changes in inflammatory resolu re resolution mediators and inflammation as a whole. Another concept that we're examining in the lab is that we've so far de demonstrated that exposure and metabolic syndrome reduces the ligands that are responsible for inflammatory resolution. Marzen 1, resolvin D2, resolvin 1 are examples here that we're showing. Now, these mediators actually are, when, once released, activate specific receptors. And these specific receptors do a lot of signaling that lead to resolution. So our concern was with our disease model is, is that we know we're getting reduction due to exposure in the ligands, but are, what's the ability of the cells to receive the resolution signaling? And so what we did was we took out uh, mouse lungs uh, from healthy and metabolic syndrome animal models, exposed and uncontrolled controls uh, to silver nanoparticles. And we also isolated um, macrophages specifically from this and they showed the same pattern. So what we're showing here is the lungs. And so the Marsin 1 receptor, LGR6, we see that nanoparticle exposure reduces uh, the expression of this uh, resolution receptor in, uh, in healthy animal models. This receptor is already reduced due to metabolic syndrome. So, and then we don't see any changes with the silver nanoparticles. So what we're observing here is that metabolic syndrome animal, model, animal models may not produce the same amount of ligand to resolve inflammation, and they also don't have the receptors necessary to receive that signal to signal for a resolution. What we're also observing here is that the healthy animal model during exposure actually begins to look like a metabolic syndrome disease model uh, following the exposure. Um, at baseline. And so we see the same patterns of response for the resolve in D2 receptor, as well as for Chem R23, the resolve in E1 receptor. And so this is an area of future research for our laboratory, examining these receptors and what these receptors uh, diminished activity mean from the signaling uh, subsequently to resolution. Another concept here is, is that we've looked at acute responses thus far that demonstrate uh, an exacerbation of response, but, all, but another important part of this uh, inflammation is the sustained response. So if you don't have the activation of these resolution signaling mechanisms, you may have this uh, sustained inflammatory response. So we performed the time course here looking at healthy and metabolic syndrome, looking at neutrophilic influx. So what you can see here is that the neutrophilic influx for both models seems to peak at three days and it was exacerbated at one day and three days in the metabolic syndrome animal models. However, at three days, you see this rapid reduction in neutrophilic influx begin that's come down at seven days, and then that's a baseline at 21 days. But we believe by, by uh, you know, kind of following this curve out, it's likely this reduction at the back to baseline hit sometime around 12 days. Uh, the metabolic syndrome animal models, however, still have an increased neutrophilic influx at 21 days uh, that is significant compared to controls as well as healthy animal models. So this suggests a sustained inflammatory response. When we also look at the lung at 21 days, we see that they still have, that both animal models have sustained uh, induction of inflammation shown by gene expression of MCP1, and that's still exacerbating the metabolic syndrome. And then inter interestingly, when we look at systemic effects, we see that there's no, there's no significant increase in the healthy model in the liver induction of inflammation but there's an exacerbation of inflammation occurring in the metabolic syndrome animal model uh, that success systemic responses as far as inflammation, these exposures that are long lasting and sustained. Uh, this is just data demonstrating that we can still identify nanoparticles within the healthy and the metabolic syndrome macrophages in the lung uh, through 21 days. So they're still staying, uh, they're still in the lung, uh, although lesser amounts, they're still present. So conclusions, uh, we believe that there's a lack of understanding of initial nanoparticle biomolecule interactions. This reduces the ability to safely and effectively utilize nanoparticles for biomedical applications. Um, and that the, if we don't understand these initial interactions, we can't understand the subsequent toxicity or the safety of the uh, use of these nanomaterials. We also believe that identification of susceptible populations will allow for appropriate regulatory standards that protect everyone. And then lastly, we believe that elucidation of susceptibility mechanisms are necessary to develop interventions 
and at risk populations predisposed to enhance inflammatory responses. So when you take all of our data and you kind of put it together, what we're finding is, is that nanoparticles, when they enter an individual with some kind of underlying disease like metabolic syndrome, uh, formulate a unique biocorona. This unique biocorona has components that likely uh, increase interactions with cell surface receptors, such as scavenger receptors, is what our laboratory is focused on. This causes changes in internalization, increased pro-inflammatory signaling. We have data that demonstrates that this modifies lipid metabolism that can change the production of resolution mediators. These resolution mediators, uh, when produced at lower levels, are trying to activate receptors that are present at lower levels. This on the cells, uh, this results in exacerbated and sustained inflammation, or at least contributes to it, that can cause enhanced toxicity and disease. So at this point, I'd like to acknowledge uh, my laboratory, specifically my graduate student, Saeed and Lily, who uh, performed a lot of this research, as well as Lisa Kobos, who was in the laboratory and performed a lot of the early assessments of the biocorona. Um, I'd like to uh, uh, really appreciate my collaborators here, uh, Christina Ferreira, Jacqueline Franco, Uma Earl, and Bruce Cooper, who all are at uh, core facilities that assist us greatly with our proteomic and lipidomic and metabolomic analysis that we do. And then my funding, uh, both from the NIHS and the Purdue Showalter Fellowship. And at this point, I'm going to stop sharing, turn on, uh, and, and I'll take any questions anyone might have. Thank you so much, Jonathan. That was great. Um, yeah, you guys can unmute yourselves and ask away uh, questions that uh, you might have. Jonathan, have you connected with uh, Tony Zhao from IPPH? No, I have not, Tony. Okay, I think uh, we're going to need to maybe create that connection if uh, yeah, I appreciate if we can. It. I, I think he's he's doing also some uh, uh, good work uh, in lung related diseases as well and delivering pharmaceuticals to the lungs and uh, so I think it would be a good a good synergistic connection there if possible. Right. Uh, question questions from the audience. Anybody out there? If not, I'll, I'll ask, uh, you know, what's, what's next? Um, I'm sure you've seen, if you've been working with Christina and, and Uma and Bruce and Amber, that you've seen that they have the Synapt uh, to do tissue type imaging. Um, and I was also thinking about, have you considered doing single cell work uh, that, that might give you some some good resolution also and and more dynamic in terms of i mean it seems like you're very much into the modeling piece and and creating the model for the metabolic pathways right yeah i mean we're, we're we utilize the metabolic model as kind of a tool uh to study these exacerbated responses uh, kind of, you know, where we're going forward with this is, is that, yes, yeah, we, we're working closely with Bruce and Christina and hope to get the Synapse up and running for some of these samples uh, to do kind of that mapping. I think we're going to be able to have much better resolution because there's going to, you know, you're not going to lack the dilution of the signal that occurs. Uh, a lot of our research going forward is looking at the, the, the biochronic that forms in the lung. Uh, we have some studies that are going on right now examining mixtures of nanomaterials. So technically in, you know, environments, you're not exposed to just one of these at a time, you're exposed to mixtures. Uh, we have some experiments now looking at um, how those exposures modulate challenges uh, to pathogen exposures that may happen subsequent uh, to these nanoparticle exposures. So we may not, we may, especially at low doses where you don't have any uh, strong immune response, maybe that predisposes you to a differential response when challenged with pathogen. Um, we're also going, uh, looking, we're doing, performing a study right now examining, um, you know, disease states, so specifically looking at fibrosis and, the, you know, so we're showing differential information here, but we do have preliminary data that demonstrates the metabolic syndrome model is likely um, 
at risk for development of pulmonary fibrosis that's not seen in the healthy model or is exacerbated in the healthy model. And then we're looking at a lot of lipid metabolism signaling and how um, you know, downstream of the resolution receptors as well as why are those ligands, uh, resolution ligands being, you know, being reduced. And we're finding that um, you know, we're looking at uh, <clears throat> your traditional uh, kind of um, phosphatases uh, that are reducing the production. And we found them to be modified as well as your apolipo oxygenases are, are modified as well. And we've also found that our um, disease biocoronas elicit a unique mTOR signaling response. And we think that that may be leading to exacerbation of underlying disease state, metabolic disease state, as well as exacerbation of you know, inflammation and inhibition of autophagy and, and changes in these ligands. Very interesting. And Jonathan, let me ask you one more question since nobody but he was asking, I'm hogging the mic here. I hope you don't mind. Oh, I don't mind, go for it, Tommy. Uh, you know, one thing that I, before grew, sorry. Can you hear me? Yes, yeah, sir, I'm here. Yeah, sorry. Uh, love to detect a, an infection from a virus, for example, that occurs uh, before gross symptoms are manifested, before your fever, before, you know, all of the uh, gross symptoms that come with a viral infection. And so what I've been thinking also as you were, were talking and, and, and as I've known of your work through our uh, Indiana CTSI uh, connection um, um, that I, I, I would think that your kind of work could be important to maybe uh, showing what are the initial stages of signaling from the immune system when it interacts with a nanoparticle, regardless of what it is, a viral particle or a synthetic particle. Uh, especially if we're just talking about size and what uh, what that shell and and so on and so forth. So, it, thinking about that connection of of being able to do the time resolved studies that would allow us to to see the initial metabolic changes that are occurring due to uh, an interaction with an nanoparticle of that size. And I wonder if you could comment on that. Yeah, so a lot of our um, that notion. Yeah, so a lot of our recent proposals, a lot of our recent proposals have uh, you know proposed to examine much earlier time points and to examine those initial reactions. So we still think that we're kind of missing some of the inducers of inflammation that we could observe. I think the biochrona gets at that to a degree because we're looking at those first interactions. Uh, with the biological milieu and the, the, you know, the binding of biomolecules to the surface. Um, so we, we are hoping to go earlier with that. Um, another component too, Tommy, that we're excited about is, is that resolution opens, you know, this idea of resolution opens it itself up to something that's a little bit more translatable. Um, so if you look at a lot of the studies, what they're doing is, is they're giving stuff before the exposure and then giving the exposure and saying, oh, okay, it reduced the response. So that, it, that's good for identifying pathways. But what our studies are, are kind of moving towards is this idea, okay, if we give an exposure, we let the exposure peak or, or wait a day, then can we give these kind of resolution or modify the resolution system in order to stop the sustained inflammation? So what we're doing is we're not inhibiting the induction, what we're doing is accelerating the resolution. And that's kind of another exciting area where we're kind of moving to with this resolution, uh, you know, kind of idea is, is taking it, uh, you know, to a more translatable um, therapeutic as opposed to a uh, intervention or, or, or a pre-exposure. Right, right. And, it, and I, even thinking from a diagnostic point of view, it could be very, yeah. uh, so very interesting. So Tommy, we, we, we did an experiment uh, 
a year or so ago where we actually took uh, serum samples from different human subjects and then we formed the biochrone on the surface of them and looked at variations. And because you're looking at uh, defined uh, absorption mechanisms there, we, you could actually identify characteristics of the individual based upon what bound to the surface of the nanoparticle. We also, awesome. we also determined that if we exercise these individuals for seven days, so there was no change in cholesterol, there was no change in body weight or anything like that, the biochrona modified. So that demonstrates that you have this inter-individual variability, so difference between people, but you also have an intra-individual variation that changes kind of week to week or, or based upon lifestyle modifications that can occur. And that might, this might explain why different individuals respond differently to treatments or exposures, but also why maybe your response to treatment or exposure may change over time as an individual. Uh, yeah. Jonathan, just a quick question. I uh, don't want to go over time, but uh, uh, tell me over the diagnostic question that I had. And uh, do you think, how much do you think uh, diet intervention could affect that? Or do you think that, you know, as the treatment um, options, uh, drugs like targeted, you know, treatments will work better? Um, I think it, I think it's, uh... You know, now you're getting into kind of nutrition a little bit, uh, but, you know, I, I, I am aware of some data out there that demonstrates that EPA and DHA, when delivered by different routes, don't always have the same mechanistic response. Um, so, you know, I'm going to lean right now towards more like, you know, overall health. I think, you know, DHA, EPA supplements and diet changes are, are great. Uh, but for something as targeted as what we're talking about here with like a nanoparticle induced uh, inflammation response, you know, based upon how those lipids are metabolized, you could end up with some exacerbation of inflammatory mechanisms as well. Um, so, so yeah, the, the, the jury's still out on that because uh, I don't know, some of the data I've seen have shown that EPA and DHA supplementation prior to air pollution exposure didn't modify the response. Some showed exacerbation in animal models, and then some has shown resolution. Uh, so it seems to kind of be dependent on the, the route, the type, and the amount, of course. Okay, thank you. All right. That's great. Any other questions? Well, and if not, I want to thank you again, Jonathan. I want to thank everybody for joining in today. I uh, want to remind you that on the 14th, we have another speaker, and uh, this is uh, Satish Ukusuri, and he's doing uh, using human mobility data for data-driven multiplex network modeling in pandemics, insights from COVID-19. So uh, we're going to go back to another uh, COVID-related uh, uh, talk and uh, COVID related uh, research piece. And this has been great. I thank you all for joining. Thank you, Jonathan, for taking time uh, to put a great presentation together. And uh, let's connect about uh, joining, uh, at least having a meeting with, uh, with uh, Tony Zhao from IPPH. Yeah, sounds great. All right, take care. Bye-bye, everybody.